Good afternoon and good morning and welcome to the latest IntraFish digital event. Uh, today we'll be talking about disruption, growth, innovation, and investment in the salmon farming sector. So uh, it's going to be a fantastic, uh, fantastic hour and a half here. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to uh, opening up the discussions. So uh, today we are co-organizing this event with Anovac. I want to say thank you to them. And I also want to say thank you to uh, Unifood Technic, who is the sponsor of this event. Uh, we have uh, our person of the year presentation in just a moment. So um, please um, brace yourself for that. We have exciting uh, news on that front. And um, to open it up, I, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of the salmon farming industry. For those of you that don't know, um, it has been an incredible ride for salmon. In the span of about 40 years, uh, it has gone from virtually nothing to now 2.5 million metric tons. It has been phenomenal. And that comes down to technology, innovation, uh, drive, and a lot of hard work. Now we're entering a phase where growth is problematic. We have demand rising across several countries in the world. And the challenge now is how is the industry going to meet this demand? So we have a fantastic group of speakers that's going to talk to us about that. So to start us off, we have our co-organizer Innovacy, who's really going to produce, uh, going to present a, a, a presentation that is very timely. Um, I'm over here on the West Coast, and as most of you know, we've been uh, seeing the effects of climate change. And it has been um, kind of amazing to see. Um, it's been um, just terrible to see some of these impacts that are happening around the world. And aquaculture and salmon farming are not immune to that. And it is going to be another one of the disruptions that the industry is going to need to face. So we'll talk about that a bit, but I wanna go ahead and introduce our first speaker. She's Jenny Chorus. She is an aquaculture scientist with Anovac, and she is going to frame our discussion today. So Jenny, I want you to uh, join us if you would and um, give us a nice overview of the sector and uh, algal blooms, one of the, the largest uh, challenges the industry, industry faces. Great, uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, it looks so. great, Jenny. <laughs> great. Um, okay, so good morning or uh, afternoon, everyone, I guess, depending on where you're joining us today from. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And I just wanted to start by saying thank you to Interfish for facilitating this great event. Uh, I'm really looking forward to some of the panel discussion that's coming up. Uh, as Drew mentioned, my name is Jenny Corris, and I'm an aquaculture scientist at Innova Sea. And I'm really excited to be here today to discuss uh, harmful algae plumes and some of the impacts that they can have on salmon aquaculture farms. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm giving this talk from Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So I'll just start by uh, introducing Innovacy for those of you who are unfamiliar with us. Innovacy has only been around since 2015, but our roots go way back to a number of well-known companies. And today, we are revolutionizing aquaculture and advancing the science of fish tracking to make our oceans and freshwater ecosystems sustainable for future generations. And uh, Innova Sea is fueled by leading edge technology and a passion for research and development. We provide full end-to-end -end solutions for fish farming, uh, which includes quality equipment, consulting services, and innovative platforms and technology. We have over 25 years of experience all over the world uh, involving over 20 different species of fish uh, with multiple international offices and we have equipment deployed in over 25 countries. So as Drew kind of mentioned and um, you know I just want to start by putting the aquaculture industry into perspective. Uh, you know over the last 25 years we've seen a 75 percent increase in total fish production but the actual amount that has been produced by aquaculture has skyrocketed over this time. And in 2018, it made up 
for 46% of total fish production and supplied 52% um, of the fish for human consumption. And when we think about the next 30 years where you know, there's estimated to be another 2 billion more people on this planet, that means there's going to be increased demands for protein. And so we have to invest in sustainable food production now to meet this need. And if we look at the salmon industry specifically, you know, we are continuing to see sustained growth in production year over year. And salmon is a really highly sought after product and indicators are pointing to a growing middle class. So it's becoming more affordable for regular consumption by the average person. And so it's important that we continue to support the growth of this industry and manage any barriers to its potential success. And one of those barriers is harmful algae blooms or HABs. And that's one of the downsides of farming in um, our oceans is that we are at the mercy of its natural phenomenons. And HABs are one of these things that are causing major issues for farmers all over the world. So what are HABs? Well, algae or phytoplankton uh, are a naturally occurring species that support the base of our ocean's food web. However, under the correct set of conditions, their populations can grow exponentially or bloom in a very short period of time. And this can have you know, really negative consequences for um, some surrounding organisms. So these blooms are typically occurring in the spring or in the fall when there are increased light levels, which support photosynthesis. There's upwelling, which is bringing all of the nutrients to the surface and warmer temperatures, which is enabling uh, faster growth rates. And the problem is, is that during these blooms, the algae will completely deplete the oxygen in an area, and even more so as the bloom dies off and the bacteria decomposes the dead organic matter, and that uh, consumes more oxygen. Other species of phytoplankton will produce these neurotoxins, which can harm and even kill fish directly. Some have these mechanical features that you know, irritate uh, the gills in fish and cause a lot of problems for fish health. And um, the problem is, is that all of our farms are situated in coastal regions and that's where these blooms normally occur. And so farmers are investing in significant monitoring and mitigation techniques to protect their livestock. And a lot of time and effort and a lot of valuable resources go into collecting and analyzing and acting on this kind of information in really tight timelines. But when you have millions of dollars of fish on a farm, you're going to do everything you can to protect your livestock. Unfortunately, sometimes we do get these kind of worst case scenarios. And that's exactly what happened in 2016 when one of the most catastrophic events in the history of aquaculture hit the Patagonia fjords in the south of Chile. This event was appropriately named uh, the Godzilla Hab um, event, and it actually comprised of two, of, uh, two blooms back to back. So the first was a pseudo chatinella bloom in February, which saw concentrations as high as 20,000 cells per milliliter. And this bloom led to the largest fish farm mortality that has ever been recorded. The second bloom occurred later into March and April and was caused by a species, Alexandrium cantonella. And this species creates a toxin known as paralytic shellfish poison or PSP, and it affected over 200 shellfish farms in the region. In the region. And so if we dig a little deeper into this catastrophic event, we can begin to understand how a bloom of this magnitude formed and caused as much damage as it did. First, we have to look to the expanding ranges that we've seen from both of these species over the last few decades. Pseudochatinella has been expanding southward, while Alexandrium cantonella's range has been expanding northward to the point that they now overlap in region. Not only that, but this event occurred specifically during a particularly strong El Nino event and the positive phase of the Southern Annular Mode, or the SAM. And these are two really important climate drivers, so I'll just give you a brief overview of how they work. So the SAM refers to the shifting of the strong westerly winds below the subtropical ridge in the southern hemisphere. And a positive SAM will push these winds further south and impacts things like rainfall, wind, and temperature in the surrounding areas. El Nino events have to do with a weakening or a reversal of the southern trade winds, and that will bring much warmer water than normal 
to the Chilean coast. And typically, the El Nino conditions will enable or force the negative phase of the SAM. However, during this bloom, the SAM was at its highest positive phase. And the SAM is a sign of anthropogenic climate change and has been trending to have more positive events in recent years. And so this suggests that climate change had a strong enough influence to overcome the El Nino forcing. Now, the coordination of these two climate drivers led to exceptional water conditions, which basically enabled these two species to bloom the way that they did. And this included things like drought from record low rainfall, reduced freshwater discharge, increased sea surface temperatures, and therefore stratification in the water column, as well as the advection of more saline and nutrient-rich waters into the fjords. And now this was an extreme event, but these kinds of extreme events are mimicking potential future climate conditions, and so they help us understand some of the drivers and the impacts that these events can have, which may become more common in the future. And so while this might be the most extreme case of climate change driving algae bloom dynamics, it's certainly not an isolated one. And in Tasmania, which is a hotspot for climate change, we've seen an extension of the East Australian current due to increasing temperatures and salinities. And so this has caused an expansion of the range of a species called Noctiluca, which has been carried by this current. And this was once a rarely seen species, but now not only has its range increased, but it's one of the most prominent red tide organisms in the area. And it's causing major issues for salmon farmers in Tasmania. And it even prompted public health to release warnings against consuming shellfish uh, as it poses a danger to human health when this species is present. Another example was caused by the blob, which is not the alien life form from the 1950s or movie, but in 2015, the blob was making headlines for other reasons. In the U.S. Pacific Northwest, a giant bloom of a species called Pseudonychia reached as far north as British Columbia in BC. And this giant blob of warm water, which was about three degrees warmer than normal, had persisted in the area and it was thought to be the reason why this species was able to dominate, because the increased temperatures increased its growth rate. Now, climate model simulations and observations suggest that marine heat waves in the North Pacific, those which cause this normal or this abnormal warm water, may intensify with climate change. And so unfortunately, everywhere we look, the trends are kind of the same. Climate change is impacting our oceans, and the surface layers where phytoplankton live and bloom are the most heavily affected. And this is going to lead to farmers encountering new species due to changing and expanding ranges. They're going to see more frequent and extreme events, as well as longer plankton seasons and increased growth rates from increased sea surface temperatures. So the question is, well, what can we do about it? Well, the first step is to actually monitor and record the data before, during, and after these kinds of HAP events. And improvements in remote monitoring capabilities, as well as the development of complex databases, those that can help capture both plankton information as well as environmental data, are gonna help inform farmers of baseline and changing conditions. Especially in this new COVID era where site access can be restricted, the ability to remotely monitor and record continuous data is really key. And as we talk about monitoring solutions, I would be remiss not to mention that ANOVA-C offers technologies such as wireless sensors, cloud-based software for real-time updates, and most recently, plankton monitoring software. And this software enables your farm to store, analyze, and aggregate algae and zooplankton measurements. And we are actively working on new visualizations, which I'm excited to preview with you today. We can also talk about some mitigation strategies that exist to manage a bloom once it's occurring. Things like aeration and oxygenation systems that can provide fish with safe refuge once they're employed correctly. Land-based farming and new submersible offshore farm developments are other ways that we can avoid plankton blooms altogether. But these are solutions to deal with algae blooms once they've formed or to avoid them. But what happens when we think about what lies ahead? how do we tackle the increasing amount of pressure that these coastal farmers will face from more frequent and intense bloom threats? And so the first thing is that we need to prioritize quantifying both the global and the regional economic impacts of HABs. Despite it being recognized that they have a large impact, there is very limited data um, about it. 
the second thing is that we're going to gain this additional, inf the way we're going to gain additional information about HABs, things like how and when they form, is going to come from big data streams. And these data streams are going to be providing continuous oceanographic data to inform things like machine learning and novel algorithms. And aquaculture farms are poised to collect this kind of data and provide it to key stakeholders and scientists for analysis. They're already situated in these coastal regions and collect much of the information that is crucial to understanding bloom dynamics. Data these days is really powerful. And while individual efforts are needed, collaboration between farms and with scientists and other stakeholders is going to be necessary. If the goal of sustainable aquaculture is to help feed our growing planet, um, and we continue to suffer losses of these magnitudes in increased frequencies, it's going to be hard to expand the industry beyond what it is today. And so the future of HAB research should engage the aquaculture industry and leverage these partnerships between some of these key stakeholders. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, if you're looking for any additional resources that were included in this presentation or just want to broaden your knowledge about plankton, please feel free to visit the link here to access this material. And I've also included my contact information for anyone who would like to get in touch with any questions they may have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny. And uh, as I said, I think that it's, uh, it's very timely as we all deal with the effects of climate change. Um, and, uh, and we will get back to that in, when we introduce our panel. But first order of business, uh, we've had to delay some things uh, as all of you had. And one of the things that we've had to delay is our person of the year presentation. Now we normally do that in Brussels uh, at the Brussels Seafood Show, uh, but um, things intervened uh, as everybody knows. So we're very excited uh, to be able to present that today. It is a milestone, it's actually three milestones. It's the first digital presentation of the Intrafish person of the year. It is the first feed company that is uh, going to be given a person of the year award. And it is the first female uh, that is given the award, which is very long overdue. So this person was chosen for her leadership on innovation, her partnerships with companies that have driven new technologies, her embrace of new and innovative alternative feed ingredients, which are so important to supplementing fish meal and fish oil as the industry looks for ways to feed this tremendous growth. So it is with a very, very, uh, very, very happy feeling that I will be turning the uh, camera over to our Interfish 2020 Person of the Year, Teresa Logberjord who is the CEO of Scredding. Teresa, if you could quickly join us, uh, congratulations. And the podium is yours. Wow, <laughs> I'm very proud. Thank you very much, uh, Drew. Uh, well, what, what can I say? Uh, I'm honored. Of course, uh, on myself, on behalf of myself, but uh, uh, of course, uh, on behalf of uh, the Scratting team, especially those perhaps working closest to me, uh, I take it as a um, as a recognition that what we are doing is uh, is recognized, it's uh, appreciated, and uh, that we are on uh, on the right track. Uh, and uh, what can I say? Thank you very, very much, uh, Drew, for 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 the award, and and I'm very, very happy be personally and I'm sure the whole organization will be exceptionally proud of of this so thank you very much well Teresa we'll look forward to seeing you at a future event where we can actually give you the award in person so it's uh it's going to be great to see you uh hopefully sometime soon and actually shake your hand and hand you the award so congratulations yeah. thank you very much so Teresa, if you could just stay on camera because uh, Teresa has uh, agreed to join us as a panelist. So from person of the year to 
being grilled on a panel. That's very bold and brave. Uh, and we'll bring in our uh, additional panelists to start our discussion. So if panelists could turn on their cameras and their microphones. And we're joining from all over the world. So we're joining from islands in Norway, from the humid, uh, humid temperatures of Miami, uh, and uh, and uh, we're also joining from from Chile. So uh, I'll just quickly introduce the speakers um, so that everyone knows uh, who we uh, have on this fantastic panel. So you just met Teresa, and uh, and I will go ahead and uh, introduce the rest of our crew. We actually have a special guest, a uh, surprise guest uh, down in Miami, who I'll introduce in a moment as well. Uh, we have Alf Goran Knudsen. He's the CEO of Kvaroy Fiske Optret. He'll be joining us. Uh, Ricardo Garcia is the CEO of Salmones Kamanchaka. Welcome, Ricardo. Ana Vistendal is with DNB, the largest seafood lender in the world. And we have Carl Oysten Oyahag uh, down in Miami and also Johan Andreasen, uh, both the leaders of land-based salmon farmer Atlantic Sapphire. So we're here today to talk about disruption. We're here to talk about growth. We're here to talk about uh, all the potential opportunities in salmon, but also all the challenges that we're going to face. And we have a fantastic spread across this panel to address so many different aspects of how the industry is going to look at growth and what needs to happen to continue that growth and meet that growing demand. So that's the, the framing of the discussion. And I wanted to start out with an open-ended question a bit. And Anna, I'll start with you. But as you have looked over the past few years, and in particular, I should say, the past six months, what, in your view, is the most disruptive thing that is shaping the industry? I'm assuming, assuming we could all say COVID uh, is one. But sort of setting aside that trend, what are some of the macro trends you see that are really changing the way the industry will be will be moving in the future? Yeah, perhaps you know the, the, the trends that we are seeing is of course it is land based. We think that offshore is coming, but if, if then I turn back to COVID nineteen and, and see what is happening, um, it seems like I mean the volume of salmon being eaten in Europe and US actually has increased. But of course you have had this major shift from the Horeca market to retail. And that is benefiting the, the players in the industry where which have a, a, which are vertical integrated and they are have a, a retail uh, arm and are selling the fish directly to the retailers. So perhaps that as we can see that this that is a very robust business model. But then, of course, land-based, there are so many uh, out there that are seeking to do uh, stuff. And we actually do think that uh, that uh, offshore uh, farming will be coming. So I suppose these are the three trends that, that we are seeing. And then a bit of green financing. That is also a major trend. Financial community pushing. <laughs> That's perfect. We're going to discuss all of those things in, in depth. Um, so, Ricardo, just over to you on the question. Um, one thing that's been exciting to see um, has been the Norwegian development licenses. And we've all seen these amazing uh, drafted drawings of what they might look like. We've seen some of those come to fruition. Uh, what is your view on how those technologies that Anna just mentioned, offshore technologies, subsea, uh, closed containment, where do you see those playing a role uh, in the future? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I couldn't start this without uh, congratulating Teresa for being uh, the person of the year, the first lady of the year. Uh, so congratulations again uh, for that. Uh, it's it's great. Uh, it's great to see that. Well, I, I, I've been looking and uh, analyzing these quoted new technologies, uh, 
that Anna mentioned and that everyone is talking about. Uh, but I'm, I'm quite convinced that our, our upgraded traditional technology will continue to dominate the salmon farming industry for many years more, uh, mainly for two reasons. One, it has a clear cost advantage by using the fish in natural environments after smoltification in fresh water. And second, we are taking, and because the industry as a whole has taken a decisive step forward for far salmon sustainably, addressing some of our historical problems. Freshwater acidulation system followed by seawater pens still have plenty of room for improvement with marginal investment in areas such as disease control through vaccine development, parasite control by non-pharma tools, including freshwater treatments, very large new high-tech uh, well boats, environmental control by utilizing up wells the water flows and oxygen plant to prevent algae and oxygen deficits in water, such as the one that mentioned Jenny a few minutes ago, robotization and automatization of the seaside operation with intellig uh, artificial intelligence, which is something that is only beginning. Feed and function and feed strategy has also been developed quite substantially. And also uh, on, on the processing side, there is a lot of things going on. So, despite these, uh, these opportunities on the traditional farm, though, uh, the volume growth of traditional farming is, is limited. It is limited by coastal uh, protection, social pressures, regulatory limitations, and the biology it's, itself within the coastal bounds. This uh, long-term shortage, uh, if you want, will, in my view, will accelerate with COVID-19 and open a space for this new way of farming. I think, though, that is a little early to say which one will dominate. Each has merits, but also problems and risks yes, yet to be assessed. So far, we've seen little experience of these risks and incidents, but they will come as they develop. At the end of the day, Drew, it's a marathon of decades not years. Uh, and finally, just a, a word on these new technologies. If, if you take a little bit into perspective the volume, if you take all the RAS uh, facility being developed in different stages by the leader ACFA, and you put them all together throughout all the world, is about 150,000 metric tons of production in the coming uh, years that, that to be deployed in the market in the next years. However, if you take a look of the demand, overall global demand in a year, it grows on a normal circumstances, not naturally in 2020, at around of 150 to maybe 170,000 metric tons of new consumption every year. Uh, that size, that volume uh, growth is uh, similar to, for example, Aqua Chile. Uh, size or Leroy, that uh, every year there will be many years, decades in my view, before a new way of farming can provide such large volume growth uh, to, uh, to, to serve the market. In all those years, there is a lot of opportunity for the traditional farming, which I would call the upgraded traditional farming. All right. Well, I know we have a, a couple of executives that uh, might disagree with you on that, Ricardo. But we we will yes. we will uh, we will uh, we'll give a nice big chunk to land-based farming uh, in a little bit later. But Alf Goran, um, just from your view, you've taken a slightly different approach. It's a family-owned farm, uh, mid-size, smaller-size farm, and your approach has been more taking the point of sustainability. Uh, reducing densities and maybe moving toward more uh, higher value in terms of how the fish is raised rather than looking at density and growth. So do you feel that, uh, do you agree with Ricardo that it's a matter of incremental expansion or do you see some of these technologies that uh, are being introduced as uh, the way of the future? Yeah, first of all, uh, Ricardo has a lot of good points with uh, regarding all of these uh, things. Uh, I believe um, land-based and offshore is part of uh, 
of the future. Um, uh, we are, uh, like he said, also in Norway where we located, it's, uh, there's a limited space of growth. You need to uh, look at uh, the area around and, and see that uh, growing on in sea-based farming will be limited uh, in a sustainable way. And we have, as you said, uh, been focusing on sustainability, fish welfare, uh, making a, um, trying to do things better, changing the feed, adapting to new technology, all of those things to to see how can we farm better and how can we farm uh, more in a better way. And I think that's part of the future. Um, but we, are, as you know, we we don't see the land base as a competition. It's uh, it's more a way of. Uh, being together, the industry was based on uh, people uh, learning from the first one and, and uh, uh, learning each other how to do this. The, the land based, of course, some of them are going to have problems, they will fail in some part, but in the end, I think even the RAS technology and the flow through systems will find ways to solve that. They will find ways to produce more fish. And like Ricardo said, the, the demand for salmon has. Uh, there's no way uh, at the moment we can see that we're going to have more salmon than the mom will be in the years to come. So I believe there's a, there's a solution in everything together. Yeah, and we can talk a bit about that as well, that so far uh, consumers have been willing to pay those additional prices and, and yeah. when will they hit their, their limit. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, Anna, I, I want to talk to you when you see uh, when you see Ocean Farm One, when you see these massive projects. Um, now I know that the development licenses are, are a unique situation, um, but when you see these projects and, and you look at where the future might go, what do you think about financing? These are massive projects, and it's going to take uh, it's going to take a lot of risk from lenders. So, how do you see a lender like DNB? Um, leading this charge and, and what's going to be the, the first mover in financing these uh, high capex projects? I suppose we are the first mover, but, uh, but uh, I, I mean, I agree with Ricardo, you know, I mean, lead time in salmon farming is so long. Uh, the, the, um, the benefits of producing in the ocean is, I mean, very well. So, 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 I mean, that will be, you know, for, 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 the, for this decade, you know, the, the others, that will be additional stuff. The main thing will be uh, producing in the ocean. And then uh, like uh, the offshore farming, what we have seen, you know, all the development licenses, they have been financed under the umbrella of proven cash flow in one of the large listed companies. And you know they have the muscle to finance themselves, and then this is easy. It is not the problem. And 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 then of course for for all the uh, most banks, you know we would uh, we we prefer proven technology, uh, industrial owners. Uh, there should be some kind of cost benefit before we open up for financing uh, at all. So, so you know you need to take a lot of boxes. And still, you will not be able to, to finance a large part of an investment. It, it is just too, too risky. So, so the, the answer for most of this will be equity in the first phase. But then, of course, if you prove that you are able to do this, then things will open up. And it, it is this way that capital markets, they are functioning. Good things, they will be financed. I don't think that that will be a, 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 a limit a limit here. And of course, there are things here which is easy to finance, biomass, for, for instance, uh, and stuff. But uh, um, yeah, yeah. For, for, for this decade, I think that these new things will be additional. Great, I'm looking it's forward to coming. For everyone. <laughs> Looking forward to coming back to that uh, and coming back to some of these projects that DND has financed. One in particular, um, again, we'll have plenty of time for land base, so I, I'm not skipping uh, Johan and uh, Carl Oystein. But I, I want to uh, hit off what, what uh, Ricardo mentioned earlier, and that's um, AI, digitization. Um, Teresa, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. How is that technology changing the way that feed is produced, uh, changing the value chain? Um, it, it seems to me uh, that the salmon farming industry is a bit behind on that. 
Um, it's moving very, very quickly. You're seeing some amazing startups. You're seeing, uh, as Anna said, within companies themselves, they're investing a lot into it. But how do you see uh, those changes um, uh, happening and, and the speed at which they're happening and how that might change efficiency in salmon farming? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Ricardo that it's, uh, it's going to shape uh, the industry going forward, uh, the, the development that we see. Uh, I think we've, we've uh, spent the last, um, you can talk for, for us, I think we, we have spent the last five years in getting our house in order. The problem is not in many, many ways what you've, uh, what you, you see where you are heading, but it's to drag along the, the, the big old organization that you have uh, in this journey toward the, towards the digital uh, uh, journey. But we have two focus areas. So you can look at the, the client facing um, interface that, that we have. Uh, so we are at the point now where we really can automize most of the collaboration that we have with the clients in many instances. So we, we can do ordering, we can monitor the health of the fish uh, if it's required, and we can actually trace uh, the feed and uh, back to, to its origin. So this part is, and to build trust with the consumers, you have to have transparency and you need to document what is, what is going on and what's actually uh, the, the, the feed that you produce. So, so that's for sure something that we've focused a lot on over the last, uh, over the last years. And, and the second thing I see is that there's a huge uh, uh, interest from startups from all over the world who have brilliant ideas on how they can help us move uh, pockets of excellence in different, different regions forward. For instance, everything from monitoring a shrimp in a pond, uh, looking at, this, at a salmon and, and uh, determining it, its health condition, uh, seeing the color, you know, there's no limits basically. So um, I think we have to make some choices and, and to me, to build the transparency and trust across the value chain is very high up there uh, on the priority line. Uh, and of course, 96, 97% of the footprint in feed production is actually from the raw materials. So, and the complexity in the raw material chain is is really big with all the to start with the all the fishermen or the vessels you have all the middle management mid, mid companies before it really hits the consumer so it's a lot of digital uh, uh, good stuff to work on there to make it perfect but we are on a good way uh, but are we uh, are we there not at all well and i want to talk a little bit about that teresa um you, you're definitely on the spot because you have three salmon farmers that are surrounding you that, that spend a lot of money on feed. Um, and, and I want to talk about um, the demands on fish meal and oil in different sectors, um, different animal sectors. So that's pressuring fish meal and oil. Um, I'm curious a bit about feed alternatives because it's, um, it's something that, that ticks sustainability boxes. And yet, it is a very small part of how feed is produced and, and the ingredients in feed. So um, tell us a bit about Scredding's embrace of that. Uh, you've struck a lot of different partnerships. Um, is that, um, is that a, a reality um, that is really going to change the way feed is produced? Or is it a bit of... Uh, hype right now in, in terms of giving a little bit of a sustainability sheen on things. Oh, I, I think it's important to to say that uh, that the feed industry and scratching we have more than one thousand different raw materials to to choose from. So I'm not uh, I'm not uh, by default agreeing to that the fish meal and fish oil we use is not sustainable. Because if, you, if it comes from good fisheries and good sources, it may be very good and very sustainable raw material. So, so all, all of the raw materials that we have can be sustainable. What I, what I see uh, on the novel ingredient, uh, I, I've said that before, they are super interesting. Uh, they create very nice niche, niches of opportunity in the industry. Um, we have still a lot to learn on the sustainability of them because the carbon footprint uh, from a production of a novel raw material, it may replace uh, the marine, but it may not be sustainable. So I have not, we're not 
discover the silver bullet yet. Uh, I would like a, a new raw material that can be scaled up, be cost efficient and, and flow through all of our solutions. But we are keeping looking and we are encouraging people to do the same and, and, and to scale it up eventually uh, to, to get to a point uh, where where we can uh, be completely independent of certain macro ingredients and replace them with something that is there for long run. Ricardo, I see you have some follow-up to that. So feed, yes. um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we're looking at maybe 70% of cost. So um, what do you see about these alternative ingredients and what could be done or what message would you like to send to Teresa about these cost pressures? Well, I, I couldn't send any message to Teresa that uh, she already doesn't know because we, we, we speak a lot. But, um, but a couple of messages which I think is important. We at uh, the Global Salmon Initiative have been working for more than five years in promoting and boosting alternative uh, novel oils to support the uh, marine ingredients and particularly the uh, fish oil. And uh, so far, there has been a lot of development there, but on the cost side, it has still not uh, uh, been competitive enough to be used uh, in a massive way. On the other hand, and in parallel, I would say, if you take a look over the last five years, there has been a very, very substantial improvement in the sustainability of the fisheries itself. Uh, you know that I also wear the hat of a fisherman and uh, producer of fish meal and fish oil. And uh, if, if you see the changes in sustainability and certification, MSC and the like of the fisheries in Chile, which is an important supplier, if not the most important supplier of marine ingredients to the Chilean salmon farming, there has been a major, major, major improvement in that. And that is not only achieving the certification for uh, these fisheries, but also to increasing the volume that is available. Because you are sustainable, the amount of fish uh, that you can take out of the ocean can grow if it's well managed. Uh, so there is a potential of a further supply on marine ingredients that can serve well. Uh, the feed industry uh, that Teresa mentioned. Uh, being aware that today, Teresa, if I'm not wrong, the ingredients in our salmon feed uh, has more than 50 or 60 components uh, from where you choose from. So there is a lot of opportunities there. Great. And, uh, I Carlos, said, I or... Go ahead, Teresa. No, no, no. It's okay. Uh, Carlos Stein and Johan, um, a big part of how Atlantic Sapphire has positioned itself um, in, in terms of where it is in the market has been about sustainability, obviously. So what's your view on feed? I know that you've made some partnerships with uh, byproducts uh, producers. So how do you see these ingredients as being an important part of the sustainability message? Um, and, and if I could follow up a bit on that too, where do you feel that uh, feed is in terms of creating the right diet for, uh, for what you're trying to do with your land-based production? Yes. Thank you. Drew. Well, first, first of all, we also want to just uh, congratulate Teresa on uh, on being uh, nominated as Person of the Year. It's a very worthy winner that uh, Interface has chosen. Uh, to, to, to get to your question, uh, for us, sustainability is definitely a key part of our business plan, and we want to drive the change towards more sustainable feed ingredients. As we talked about, this could be, for example, single cell proteins or cells. It could be looking at algae. And we are working close with, with our feed partner, for example, with scripting on finding better solutions for the future. We think it's not, not only good for the, for the world, but we think it's especially important for a product like us that really uh, catches a big premium in the market. Uh, a lot of it thanks to the fact that it is the most sustainable alternative out there. Yeah, to build on that, Carl. Um, one of the things that we're working hard on is to, to kind of eliminate all marine in ingredients in the feed. Um, because with the marine ingredients comes also PCBs and dioxins and heavy metals from the ocean. And uh, there are a lot of new ingredients out there now that will give us the omega-3 levels that we want without get getting in all these heavy metals that, you know, is a concern. 
So uh, we, we, our aim is to kind of go completely out of the oceans, not, not only on the farming side and on the effluent side, but also on the feed ingredient side. And I just want to mention too, our 2019 person of the year is here as well, and that's Johan Andreas. And so we have two two persons of the year on this panel, which I don't think we've ever had. So there's another milestone. Um, so, uh, but Alf Goran, uh, just based on what Johan just said, um, PCBs, dioxins, uh, issues like that. Um, again, uh, Clara has positioned itself uh, as a uh, as a sustainable provider of uh, salmon farming. How do you see those issues? Do you agree that those are concerns and that the industry should be moving itself away from fish meal and oil as an ingredient? Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a problem. Uh, I don't agree that we have to move away from marine ingredients. Uh, I think there are solutions and there are technology that we can, uh, like we are doing with our field, cleaning out the PCB and the oxygen from the marine ingredients that we're using in the field. And, and you have to remember, our field, we have, uh, cost-wise, we have moved the field a long way. Uh, we have do, done that because we have a market that is willing to pay the, an extra premium for it. And I believe also that the industry, we have to move together. It, it's uh, being the first mover, we always have to pay the extra cost of uh, bringing in new ingredients, doing all of that. So if we as an industry move together, we'll reduce costs, we'll be able to, to uh, move more towards a sustainable uh, production and, and uh, feed and everything. And we are, as you know, we have lifted our omega-3 levels uh, and reduced the marine ingredients by using the, the corpion algae oil. And I see that as uh, some a part of the future, uh, uh, taking in algae oil or as uh, Johan said, one singular uh, production of uh, protein or, or those kind of things. But uh, going completely away from marine ingredients, uh, I don't know, it, it sounds it's extreme, but I understand as a land-based farm, you, you want to, no, it's not only good enough to be on land, you have to also do something about uh, feed and, and the way they produce with the feed. So I, I kind of understand, but we have found our niche and our way of doing it. So uh, here's, oh, Anna, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just a comment from the side there. Of course, you know, to make use of things in the ocean, which you cannot use for, for, for human uh, humans, I think that is a good uh, thing. And then, of course, I don't know how to put this, but, but you know, it is important that someone is doing the, the R&D which is needed in this sector. Uh, there has been complaints, you know, uh, perhaps the margins are too low in the the, the feed uh, uh, feed companies, uh, Teresa. But you know, to put uh, uh, sufficient uh, resources into into the R and D here, that is uh, of great importance. And I think if the you know because the the, the feed companies, uh, some of them they are a part of a large conglomerate. So perhaps R and D funds are going in other directions than to salmon farming. And then I think that the fish farmers. Perhaps they also, you know, should take a part here, you know, to push the development like natural gas fermentation. There is a lot of alternatives here, which could be, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm looking forward to, 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 to an improvement, actually. And then we also see uh, one of the green bonds that has been issued uh, this year has special clauses in the, in the loans, you know, saying what type of feed and from when the, from whom they are going to buy this. So so if there are, because the salmon farming, it is a value chain thing, right? And if there are things that we really don't like here, that could be part of the value chain. So there is a room for improvement. Yeah. Didn't mean so to be negative. I just, congrats to this. <laughs> I, I was just going to go to you, Ricardo, because I see your, your hand going up, but um, you know, you're uh, among this panel um, running what I would say the most conventional uh, salmon farming company. Um, so where do you see the role is for uh, a company like someone who's come in Chaka um, in driving these these things? Um, what responsibility do, does uh, come in Chaka have in particular within the framework, for example, of the Global Salmon Initiative? 
uh, well, uh, just, uh, just a word on marine ingredients, which I cannot uh, leave it uh, there, but uh, we need to, to put this into perspective. Uh, years ago, about 50% of the ingredients of the salmon feed was marine based. Today, that's about one seventh uh, in the totality. Uh, so, so there has been a lot of uh, reduction uh, by including several ingredients, such as the one that Teresa mentioned. But also uh, bear in mind that the, con the feed conversion fact uh, ratio of the salmon farming industry has been uh, lowering and lowering uh, every year. We used to have in Chile 1.3, 1.4 many years ago, and today Simone Camachaca is running below 1.2 in the 1.1 to 1.15 level. That's an enormous pressure on less feed in general. So those macro trends are helping the marine ingredient market. And as you can see today, if you take a look at the last uh, maybe two or three years, there has been very stable prices on marine ingredients. And that is an expression, a market expression, that the market is stable and providing enough uh, raw material for the various needs. Now, back to your question, uh, where do we see uh, uh, companies such as Salmonic Camanchac, as you mentioned, traditional farming, to put it in, in, in the word. I would say that substantially upgrading what traditional means. And there are several developments on traditional farming that are coming to the market and are coming to our processing. Uh, I mentioned some of them, sea lice treatment, and in general animal welfare, uh, molecular genetic improvement that will make our fish healthier and more robust, growing faster. Vaccine development, lowering the need to use uh, antibiotics. On-site devices to reduce the risk of algae bloom and lower oxygen level that I also mentioned. Functional needs that improve, improve the feed uh, conversion ratio and lower the cycle. Uh, marketing strategy, we haven't talked about marketing and there are major things happening on the marketing side, particularly after these COVID-19 events, which maybe we can talk later. Uh, and there are some technologies to defrost frozen products that are keeping the attributes of fresh at the final market. That is an enormous advantage for the more distant producer to the major markets. That's also coming. Um, and the use of artificial intelligence that you mentioned at the C pen, absorbing millions of data that could be used to optimize operational decisions. Um, there, there are major development at the processing level for value-added product in the, in the point of production, not necessarily in the point of consumption that we in Salmonic Camanchaca, for example, are, uh, are implementing. In fact, we will become uh, this next quarter the number one exporter of portions in Chile. Uh, uh, and, and, and that is pre precisely because we see uh, very large opportunities on the market side for more value added product. So I, I couldn't really uh, tell all the initiatives that we have at the quoted traditional uh, farming that we have that will improve uh, the efficiencies in which we farm today. There is still a lot of opportunity in the major way of farm, uh, and that is uh, not at all minimizing or undervaluing the enormous contribution of people like uh, like uh, Johan uh, or the other uh, leaders of the new technologies, huh? but there is still 2.3, 2.4 million tons produced by traditional means, and the demand is growing 150,000 metric tons every year, so there's plenty of room for everyone here. Huh? We, we talk a lot about the marginal thing, huh? sometimes forget about the major uh, way of producing. So, Ricardo, you mentioned uh, sea lice, and by some estimates, that costs the industry uh, upwards of a billion U.S. dollars. 
So, Alf Goran, um, are you happy uh, with the speed of progress of addressing uh, sea lice mitigation uh, in the industry? Yeah, and you have to you have to look at the history. You have to look at where we were uh, ten years ago uh, regarding lice, and, and uh, look at where we are now. We were. Uh, at one point, uh, when the limits and everything was reduced in the tempo, it was reduced. We were having problems, of course, with the uh, overuse of chemicals and uh, medicines. And today we are at a, a point where that has been reduced uh, significantly. And, uh, and the Norwegian farm industry has done a lot and invested a lot in capacity to, to fight the lice with uh, with uh, treatments that are non-chemical or non, yeah. So it's it's looking at where we were and where we are now. I believe we have done a lot, but there's still a lot that we haven't touched in yet. Uh, genetics, uh, uh, oral treatments in in hatcheries, uh, all of those things, new medicines that can have an effect uh, and no traces in the product, and all of those things are are coming forward and. And of course, you have the laser that is improving every year. Uh, yeah, there are so many things happening. There's so much technology being put into this. And, and uh, I, like Ricardo said, there are there are still many, many things we can do better that will improve production and increase production in sea-based farming. So I, I believe sea-based is going to be the most important way of farming. And, and into the future still, even though we'll have land base and those things, but that's, that's way ahead. Yeah. Teresa, where are functional feeds and uh, uh, other, um, other innovations on the feed side right now in addressing fish health? Um, give us a sense of, of some of the things that might be mitigating these issues, including sea lice. First of all, a little bit uh, to, to what uh, Anna said on uh, on uh, reducing R&D and uh, due to margin pressure in the feed sector. Uh, we cannot do that, so we will have to continue, uh, and we want to continue the R&D efforts that we have and uh, in the salmon business. Perhaps, uh, given the given the growth ambitions and uh, the more more of our efforts will go into the raw material side, you know out the new raw materials, how they work, etc. Um, on the on the um, and, and having that flexibility so that we can um, we are not experts on the consumers. So some farmers, some customers have a strategy that includes all in marine. Someone has a completely other view on the market. And I see our role as making them both of them good. So so creating a profitability and efficiency for, for those concepts that are developed. So what we need is, is volume, it's always better, and then we can play a, a very important role, I think, with all our uh, R&D. And uh, we've developed uh, health uh, solutions for, for fish, for, for many species, uh, especially for salmon, and uh, and they are part of the solution. Of course, they are not fixing the, the, the lice situation alone, but in combination uh, with other Methods, uh, the Botec, for instance, so on salmon, the skin health products that we have are making a good, uh, a good difference in accordance to our R and D, uh, and they are a supplement, a good and important supplement that many many farmers are are using and uh, giving us a good deal, a deal of credit for. So one uh, company here that does not have to worry about sea lice, of course, is Atlantic Sapphire. Um, and I want to move a little bit to the market side now. Um, and uh, in a sense, Atlantic Sapphire has gone all in on sustainability, and that's really how the on the market side how the company has been framed. So um, tell us a bit, Johan and, and Carlo Stein, about how the market has reacted to land-based salmon as a potential product. Um, we will get to the um, digging down into detail about land base and the excitement surrounding it. Um, but on the market side, tell us a bit about what has the reaction been and have you found um, that you've needed to compare land based salmon with uh, traditional net pen salmon farming? And is there a risk in, in making those comparisons? 
So we are now in the, in the great state that not only have we been farming salmon from our Danish facility for years and being, being able to sell that volume for for uh, a while, even though it is on the in a global basis a relatively small volume. But, but now we also have the US product coming online with the first harvest just days from now. So we've been able to actually go out, speak to all our customers and get the real feedback on the US product. And we're very pleased to see that that the, the feedback is great. People love the story. One part of the sustainability. Another important part is the traceability story. The fact that it's local, made here in the US market for Americans. So we, we feel we get a lot of traction. And I think one of the ways that is reflected is also in the fact that we, we do get a very large price premium compared to what uh, conventional sea-based salmon is fetching here in US retailers. Yeah, I think to add on this, I think also the um, the freshness aspect of it. Uh, we, we will be by far the freshest fish in the US market. You know, we uh, you know we will harvest on a Monday in Miami, and basically you have to 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 put the fish in a cold storage to wait two days to pull the pin bones uh, to to supply the local retailers here in in Florida. Whilst when we for the Californian market, we just stick the the, the pin bone in fillets into a truck spend a couple of days on the road and then we pull the pin bones in California. So we, we, will, have, we will have a very fresh product um, that has not been seen before in the US and um, that will le uh, lead to um, less of a fishy taste, a uh, higher perception of freshness that we think the consumers are going to love. So, uh, Elkhorn, that's been uh, the sustainability story has been crucial for your company as well. Um, you've got some listings with some some major um, sustainability focused retailers like Whole Foods. Um, how do you see that um, that sustainability story for uh, more conventional net pen salmon farming? Is that um, is that something um, that you've uh, been able to articulate to these buyers when they see technologies like land based salmon, um, or are they saying? Um, you know, hey, can you be more sustainable? Now, we have been working with Whole Foods since uh, 2008 or 12, yeah, 2012 uh, uh, direct. And it's, uh, yeah, it's they have moved the whole industry with, with their standards and with their uh, demands uh, on uh, into the industry that we have moved with them. And they have always been pushing us uh, towards more sustainable production. So. And they, they have land-based is uh, approved according to their standards because of the green rating in Seafood Watch. Uh, they will take in land-based. And I, again, it's, I, don't, I don't see that we are in a premium market. We get a premium price on our fish. I don't see the land-based uh, uh, as a competition or it, yeah, it's a competition, but it's, there's more than room for everyone uh, in the market. Uh, there's not going to be any problems with, uh, with the land base controlling in them. And they will probably get, like Johan said, they will get a, a better premium than us because of the freshness and because of the closeness to the market and those things. But uh, there will still be room for uh, companies like my uh, small family company that are focused on sustainability and, uh, and uh, are in the market with the product. And, and Whole Foods is supposed to uh yeah i think they will uh, they are proudly telling the story of our sea based farming and how we do it and how we try to be more sustainable and and try to uh, every every year and every production move forward so uh, yeah so Anna, i want to talk uh, from a lender's perspective how important uh, you mentioned green bonds how important will sustainability will continuous um, improvements in sustainability impact um, companies and their financing? First of all, I mean, to, to do the green financing, that is also a marketing thing for a company. I mean, like uh, we have uh, been raised two bonds this year, both for movie and, and Greg. And of course, to, you know, to, to tell to the market that we have a green bond. And of course, the, the, the green bond is that because the, the purpose of, of what you finance with the bond is, is a green purpose. So that, that is uh, good. So I, but over time, I think that, you know, we, we see so many investors 
with ESG mandates. That goes for equity. Johanny can tell that you know it's not difficult to raise equity for, for, for land based. Uh, and it also goes for, for, for the bond the bond side. So you know there is a huge demand from, from investors. And it but it's um, um, there will also be green bank loans and there will be sustainability linked loans that you know that, that as a company for instance uh, Ricardo he can say that you know we plan to reduce the, uh, the, the, the way we use antibiotics going forward and then we, we can say ah oh, that's a good thing then you can get uh, get a bit lower margin I think that th these types of financing are, are, are coming um so 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 we'll, yeah just to you know to, to uh, everyone wants you know this is this industry also conventional it is more of the solution than it is the problem you know in, in banking we do a number of, of sectors but still if we can do something to influence even more we will try to do so this is important for all financial institutions Ricardo, you had a thought. Yes, uh, I think that um, uh, everyone uses sustainability word all, all the day. I haven't seen yet one company that says we are not sustainable. And we don't want to be more sustainable in the future. Everyone says uh, the same. It's, it's embedded in, in, in our industry. And I think that that pressure comes from three sources. One that is coming from the market, from the consumer, uh, whether the consumer or sometimes the retailer or the food service that is pressing for more sustainable uh, uh, food, that's one. Second, it comes from financing, uh, mildly yet, uh, though, Anna, is still very, very small pressure, but it, in my view, it will be increased over time. But the number, the, the third uh, source of uh, pressure comes from society, from where we farmed, from where we operate, uh, whether the, the local communities, the regulators, uh, the people that live, the workers that work with us. And that is, in my view, the most important pressure that we have today to become, or not to become, because you don't, you, you never become sustainable. You are more sustainable uh, over time. It's a, it's a, it's a continuous uh, progress uh, pattern. It's not that you are or you are not. Uh, so, and, and on that side, there are many, many things yet to be done to, to become uh, uh, more sustainable. So sustainability need double and triple click really to understand uh, and to address it and to manage it. So let's talk a bit about land-based salmon farming. And this is where um, where Carl Oystein and, and Johan, you're gonna get um, some, some additional time here. So, uh, there's a, a wide range of estimates of what we'll actually see in production. You both happen to be right in the spotlight. Every little move you make is going to be scrutinized and I'm sure you're getting used to that. Um, but I think it's fair to say um, that we're in a bit of a gold rush right now. And it can be a bit unclear who's serious, who's not serious. Um, it, it's quite easy to announce a project. Uh, you can announce any size of project you want. Uh, if you don't have financing, uh, the sky's the limit. But why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, the challenges of being the first mover here? Because, uh, as I said, the spotlight is right on you um, for success or or failure. And um, tell us about the pressure that puts on you as, a, as an organization. Sure. So uh, I think you're right, Drew, that, that we, we do feel that the spotlight is on us, but that's a situation that we are comfortable with. We're, we've always been very open and we like to showcase what we're doing because we think it's, it's uh, moving the industry in the right direction. I think uh, we, we talked a lot about it already that uh, what, what other panelists have already said, Lambes is not going to come with a giant supply shock to the market within the next decade. The reasons are simple. It's a very difficult way to produce. It's taken us 10 years to get to where we are today. It's complex. 
the technology that, that we depend on, in our case, the RAS systems, they're not commonly available. You cannot go and order a RAS farm that uh, is plug and play for you to operate. And once everything that, all of those arguments are taken into account, you still have the very long lead time that has already been mentioned, right? From you from passing the huge milestone of actually getting financing in place, you will also have to first do the design, uh, the planning, get uh, uh, find the right construction partners. The actual building is going to take a couple of years, and then once that is done, you need to actually farm the fish. So at least you're looking at uh, five years, and in most cases it will be more if they're even able to to get into construction phase. So. I think we, we also very much agree from, from Atlantic Sapphire's point of view that you will not see an enormous growth from land-based. Uh, this will probably have a bigger effect after the, this decade is over than it will have on this one. But uh, then again, we're confident that land-based is here to stay. I, mean, so, also, uh, the, you, I think just to be clear what land-based means, you know, we, what we are doing is land and based full growth cycle um, based on a RAS technology. But you also have a tremendous amount of land based in the conventional industry. Companies such as uh, Kamachaka, for example, and Movi has a large amount of land based facilities. And I think uh, maybe I believe that's the highest uh, spend on CapEx in the conventional industry is to build out large um, post malt facilities. And I think that's going to be the biggest contributor to a higher productivity within the conventional industry. And it's going to eventually be the highest contributor to increased global production of salmon. What we are doing is, as, as Carl said, it's, it's going to take time. Uh, it's very complicated. Uh, these projects are mega projects. Uh, for those of you that have been in Miami, just to look at our 10,000 tons facility, uh, can relate to that. Um, the RAS piece is only a small piece of it, about 30 to 40 percent of the, of the capex is, is RAS. You have to manage fish movement, fish health, um, you have to operate these farms every day. Uh, it's not like in a net pen where you can go home and, and the fish is still swimming in a net pen. We need to manage every minute year round to, to, to deliver this. So it's very complicated and I think quite frankly that a lot of these proposed companies don't know what they are stepping their toes into. And that's uh, that's a really good point there because Atlantic Sapphire, um, since you went public, uh, your share price is up 300%, I believe. It's around a billion US dollar company now. Um, on Fjord and Salmon Evolution uh, both now have a significantly high value, I think both over 150 million US dollars. Um, but Anna, DNB has felt comfortable lending to Atlantic Sapphire. Obviously high risk projects, uh, as Johan and Carl Oistlein said, these are not projects that are easy to run. Uh, they themselves have run into uh, production challenges, cost overruns. Um, this is not for the faint of heart. So. How does DNB view the land-based salmon farming sector? And um, it's high risk. Why why take that high risk? Mm, because normally we leave it to our clients to comment upon the financing. But Johan, if I may, you, you know, perhaps this is a special case. First of all, I mean, they have done how many cycles in Denmark, you know, to tick this kind of proven technology box that they have failed and failed and failed is that so but to try not to do the, the, the same mistake uh, once more so that is and then of course there is uh, 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 investors and and, and uh, people in this company with industrial experience which we have faith in and then of course there is this value proposition of being in Miami with you know with the transportation cost yeah, if you compare it to Norwegian salmon you know so, you know the ticks the box that this could be a cost efficient way actually of, of producing salmon in, in, in the US. And of course, they, you talked about first mover um, challenges, but of course there is also first mover advantages. For, for instance, a, 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 a fish farmed uh, in Miami land-based, you get a, a good price today. If there were thousands of, the, of these uh, setups, perhaps the price would be, be lower. So, so 
and, and, and to us, uh, you know, we could say that, uh, of course, we are a strong um, a player in the conventional industry and we can just uh, stay away and say we don't do this because we support this could be a black swan or a competitor to our and, and the, the clients that that no, but but then in a way um industries they are moving forward uh, and and for, for this one we we were thought this was the correct to, thing to do and of course the amount of financing compared to the equity needed it's it's not that uh, that uh, that large in the next phase here for for, for a company like atlantic software you will be able if they succeed with, with this uh, uh, first stage financing will be much easier and, and at a certain stage and you will not be the, the right uh, bank to finance then they will have green bonds and uh, but this is a, um, a movement it's a, con a continuous uh, the development uh, but we are extremely careful what we do and it's also this way that we combine debt and equity um, and it's this way that if we should raise equity for land base they also expect us to be there on the lending side not with huge amounts but with, with small so therefore we are extremely careful because sometimes if you say ah this is a good project we lend money well then all investors come and uh, so we are very very careful so let's talk about that Anna. And, and you know i mentioned that there's a bit of a gold rush here um you don't have to give the exact number but how many prospecti are coming across uh the desks at dnb for these projects yeah yeah many many <laughs> uh, <laughs> are, are you <laughs> yeah yeah but, but you know most of them they haven't got permission yet right and and and, uh, and um and they, they need to tick these boxes that I, I have been talking about, and there is a lot of them that do not tick those boxes. Mm. For instance, to do things in Norway, uh, you know, to do to do RAS in Norway, uh, you, you shouldn't do that. You do these flow-through systems that could make sense. It could make sense to have a small operation in order to try something out, but then that is for equity. And of course, it could make sense if you have a, a possible facility to, to 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 have a built on to do some land base, but but uh, uh, I, I think that uh, the the cost side here to do this closer to, to huge markets and especially markets where other other players had to flew in in uh, in salmon is the the wise stuff. Yeah. I, I was I was going to say, Anna. I wonder if you're sitting on a stack of prospecti right now, and that's uh, that's become your your chair as land based prospecti. So. <laughs> Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about financing and, and move a bit into uh, into where the sector might go in terms of consolidation, uh, not just land based, but but in general. Um, and I do want to note too for any of our audience out there, if you want to ask questions, uh, you can look up in the right hand corner of your uh, of your screen, and you can ask a question. My colleague Demi Corbin will be fielding those uh, and be able to ask a couple of those as we get closer to the end. Um, so, Ricardo, maybe we can go to you on this a bit. Um, where do you see consolidation uh, happening? How far do we have to go? We've seen some major companies that have developed. Obviously, Movie is a very big company now. Um, Cook, uh, you could say Salmar, uh, Nori Royal. They, they, these are all getting to be very big companies. And yet, there does seem to be a long way to go. So, I want to hear from all of you, starting with you, Ricardo. What what shape do you see the salmon farming sector taking in the future? Are we seeing massive vertically integrated conglomerates? Uh, are we seeing broader into different species? Um, where's the future? Well, I uh, first of all, uh, Drew, I think that uh, if you take a look of the last 10 years, there has been uh, quite a lot of consolidation already in the industry. Therefore, you take a look of the players today, both in, in the main markets in which salmon is farmed, it's pretty consolidated. I don't personally see major consolidation on the supply side and still players uh, in the coming years. That's my personal view. It might be one or two out there, but not, not in the way that we've seen over the last 10 years. That's one. Now, expanding the industry, I, I personally think that there are 
or there might be more opportunities into vertical integration than into getting into other proteins. Now, other fish, maybe. And in particular, like our experience in Kamachaka with uh, uh, the farm of the Pacific sub has been uh, outstanding. This is a species that is extremely well adapted to Chile, has no uh, antibiotic usage, no antiparasites because it doesn't get sea lice. It is very ready, uh, it is very tasty, uh, it, it, it runs very fast. Reduce the length of the cycle at the ocean. So, that might be a species that we will be developing in the future. Now, that's a species, that's a more niche species that needs also to develop markets. And that is probably one of the main challenges in which we are in now. Traditionally, that has been Japan. But we, we, we are aiming to sell more than 50% of our sales to this year into non Japanese market. That's something. To expand and also uh, as i mentioned on vertical integration there are big pockets of our value chain that are still not managed by us which might offer uh, stable profits uh, and that that are open support to teresa um uh, for for those uh people out there that may not know their their history very well um scredding is owned by nutreco and nutreco uh was uh, from the very, very start, uh, one of the key drivers of salmon farming. So movie, what is movie today, ultimately traces its roots back to Nutreco. Do you see that model um, as potentially re-emerging? Do you see that we may have complete vertically integrated companies like we had with Cermak and Avos and like we uh, once had with Nutreco and, uh, and the, the uh, companies that were the forerunners to movie? Uh, I see uh, a salmon industry which already is highly consolidated, where top uh, 15, 20 farming companies hold 80% uh, of the production. So it's really, really consolidated. And we've seen uh, some of, uh, of the universe, like Cook, like you mentioned, who, who, who integrated into new species. Uh, we have uh, some customers who are integrating forwards into retail, uh, someone backwards into feed or ingredients, genetics, etc. I think we will always see uh, involvement in the industry. Uh, but are we, uh, and, and Nutreco has invested into pockets of uh, new technology, land-based uh, farming, because we are curious and uh, we want the industry to go grow. We're curious to learn and, and we play a, want to play a role in that. Uh, I think we should expect more consolidation. Uh, are there going to be feed and, and uh, well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, we, we know what uh, Aqua Chile did recently, uh, movie did uh, uh, integrate into feed a while ago. Right now, I think uh, in general, there is nothing to get, gain from, from integrating backwards into feed. Uh, if you want to have prioritized your, your, your capital, you should do it because the, the, the savings would not, uh, would not be worth it, in my view. But uh, who knows? The time could change. So, Al, Al Gorn, I, I, I want to ask you about this as a mid size uh, company. Um, there's discussion that there's a lot of consolidation to still happen in Norway. Um, but, but uh, Clara made an interesting move by investing into a land based producer. Uh, and I'm curious about that kind of uh, diversification into these different technologies. Where do you see uh, where do you see companies expanding uh, in, in terms of technology and in terms of production um, uh, production methods? Uh, first of all, it's uh, I agree with the other ones. Uh, consolidation in the industry is uh, the last ten years has been extreme. I think it has reached a point where it won't happen anymore, and that's. That's part of, uh, I think, like we did other farms, we've already seen other farms after we came out that are investing into the land base. That's part of uh, the integration, the, the full integration part with the feed and everything like Movi has done. And of course, we don't, I don't think we're going to see more of that. I, you even see Movi going backwards again, uh, taking out the well boats and stuff like that from the 
Fugling integration, uh, there, is a, there is some points you shouldn't uh, touch and you should uh, let other ones handle, you like the field, for example. And I, I don't agree with you with the R&D for field is uh, not sufficient enough. There are, there are a lot of uh, R&D done in the field industry and, and moving the field industry forward. But I see other species, even in Norway now, we have uh, COD coming back online uh, with the fifth or sixth generation. Uh, and uh, yeah, it looks like uh, there's going to be investment into that and it's going to come from the salmon industry also. Uh, being where we are with uh, no ability or small ability of growing uh, biologically the production, it's, there's a lot of money generated. And uh, that money is either going to be used into different species, uh, land-based or technology. Technology-wise, we have been uh, taking on a lot of things, investing into companies to help them move forward, uh, like the robot fish were with Aquai, with camera systems. There's still so many things, AI, machine learning, all of that is uh, part of the future and all of that we as an industry can lift with uh, the capital we have uh, available. So uh, that's going to happen more and more. So, Carlos and and, uh, and Johan, um, how do you see a land-based salmon farm uh, functioning as we go through into the future? Will it become a part of a larger uh, salmon farming company with conventional uh, production, or is it important that it's a standalone um, operation? Or how would you see the the future of of, uh, of, of that? Well, we, we expect that uh, a company like Atlantic Sapphire uh, will remain strong on a standalone basis. And I think uh, the whole vertical integration part is something that, uh, for in our perspective, it is going to be the way forward. Bringing more things on site, having the scale to justify investments in uh, all across the vertical integration opportunities, everything from, I don't know, feed. You can look at genetics, you can uh, look at uh, more value-added products. The, the list is long. So, so I think that's, in essence, what, what we're expecting. So we are getting close and running out of time. So uh, my colleague Demi has been fielding some questions. We probably have time for maybe one or two. Demi, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm there. Uh, so again, thank you so much for everyone who filed in some questions. We got a load of questions, but as Drew said, for the sake of time, I'm going to just uh, keep it for one or two. Uh, so this is for you, Anna. Um, you were discussing that, yes, feed is important for the future, but do you think it's a good idea and economically feasible to do vertical in integration in feed, considering margins and need for R&D? No, no, I agree with Teresa. I would not do backwards uh, integration in, in this industry, perhaps forward. Um, another question, and that's for you, Altgorn. Um, how would you describe the post-consumer market uh, for salmon? Uh, post-consumer? Oh, sorry, consumer market for salmon. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear that. Yes. Um, how would you describe uh, the post-COVID consumer market for salmon? Okay, then I'm just kidding. No, it has been uh, special for sure. We have we have put all our energy into the American market, as you know. We have uh, we launched our round first of February. Uh, not the best timing, yeah, you can say, but uh, with Whole Foods Market and with the base we had there, they of course have uh, have been solid through all the time. It's uh, we were getting into a lot of restaurants. Uh, all of that, of course, uh, collapsed. Uh, we are now seeing a little bit of that coming back, but maybe in a different way. So, so I think consumers, it has, it has changed. I think uh, Ricardo talked about frozen as being uh, maybe new, fresh, uh, uh, and those kind of things. I think I think the whole way we're consuming salmon will change when we come out of this uh, COVID uh, situation. Ricardo? Yes, I, I think that something on the market uh, needs to be said, and, and there has been major development on the market inside post COVID. I think that there are, for example, everyone knows that from uh, the market has moved from food service to retail. Not everyone knows that within food service, 
salmon has taken a much larger chunk of the menu because of the of the processes processing changes happening at the restaurant reducing the staff reducing the handling of the product there has been a, a about 50 percent reduction of the number of plates being offered at the restaurants and salmon is gaining a lot of market share within food service that's one trend and that trend will continue for several months second trend is on the retailer on the retailer we've learned uh, as consumer how to buy online well maybe i did before but uh, the world now knows how to market and buy online and now they also buy salmon online that's a second trend and that will will get our the consumer the end consumer closer to the producer and that opens tremendous opportunity for branding for packaging and for more value added and the third important thing is that we have taught during this month how to cook salmon at home very simple superfood that is precisely the chilean salmon marketing council uh, Logan is salmon at home, uh, super simple, super food. And that is penetrating the brand of the consumer uh, uh, very rapidly in North America. That is a trend that will last for many, many, many years. So if, if the demand was growing six, seven percent uh, in the past because of several reasons, now we have additional fuel for that demand not with funding the fact that people will now look and chase for more food that boosts their immunity system and bingo salmon is the winner so again so so that several reasons uh to to be very optimistic on the market side so I'm going to say thank you, Demi, because uh, we do need to start wrapping it up so we can get out of here as close on time as as, uh, as we can. I, I know all of us could talk for a lot longer, but uh, but we need to we need to get going, and we'll we'll do it all again soon. Um, but I do want to go around, and uh, and my only rule for this question is uh, that you cannot say COVID. Um, that can't be uh, that can't be your uh, your answer. Um, but I'll start Coilistin and, uh, and Johan. If we're to look ahead five years in the sector, um, what do you see as the most disruptive thing that's going to be changing the industry when we uh, have this event again uh, in 2025? I think we will answer in the market scalability to be able to offer a new sustainable source of uh, supply of salmon to the growing demand side that uh, we currently see. And we think that uh, Atlantic Sapphire is definitely part of that solution. Johan, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree with Carl. I think um, uh, people are more concerned to build on what Ricardo said. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for the sector as a whole. But uh, people are going to be more concerned about people touching their food. They want to know more where the food comes from. They're more concerned about the health aspect of what they eat. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so we, we obviously are very well positioned for this, but I think it's also an opportunity for, for more uh, foreign producers from Chile and Norway to also uh, leverage on some of these trends. Of course, over to you. No, I agree with uh, all of the things said so far. Uh, traceability and um, and transparency. Great, Ricardo. It's a it's a very hard question uh, because there are so many things. But if I would say something is on genetics uh, and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, those two, I would say, the newest. Uh, things from a science point of view uh, being more applied for salmon farming, particularly uh, artificial intelligence on the operational side of the farming. Uh, that I think will completely change the way we operate uh, pens today. That I would put my dollars into that uh, bet. Anna, your thoughts on this? 
five years from now, you know, I hope that uh, we are better at solving the sea lice problem. You know, that will be doing something dramatic to the product, uh, production. Um, yeah, so, so I I hope for that. And as Ricardo says, you know, there is so many ways you can improve conventional uh, farming. So uh, I I hope, and, and the, the market is there, the, the, and the industry is getting better and better on this because uh, um, this is a fantastic product. Final word goes to our person of the year, Teresa. Well, in five years, maybe uh, maybe our customers are not only asking for the price lists, but maybe for the um, uh, carbon footprint on the feed, and they will have a, make a, a more uh, qualified choice on, on sustainability. At least I believe that will happen. Thank you so much. What an enjoyable panel. Uh, thank you all for taking the time. Uh, I know you all have busy schedules. Uh, let's do it again soon. And again, I, I hope to see you all in person and have this discussion again uh, when we can shake hands and, and look each other in the eyes again. So thank you so thank much, you, everyone. Drew. Thank you, all the attendees, for joining us. Thank you. Congratulations again, Teresa. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.